Myths are not stories that are untrue. Rather, they are tales that don't fit neatly into the historical record, which serve as a foundation to a culture. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, the ruling trinity of the Hindu gods, have just concluded the Satya Yuga, an age of truth and goodness when mankind is most in touch with them. And oh boy, are they tired. And with good reason. It's taken considerable energy to see to the well-being of an entire world for almost two million years. This is probably why Brahma, the source of creation itself, falls into a deep slumber. But as he sleeps, his very breath takes form, putting the ultimate bad into bad breath by unintentionally birthing a horde of demons. And once they come to life, the vicious monsters turn on their creator. Awakened by the pain from beasts gnawing and chewing on him, Brahma cries for help. Then it's Vishnu to the rescue, casting the unruly demons out of heaven and sending them hurtling toward the mortal realm and the netherworld. Some of these creatures, now banished to the realm of men, developed a taste for human flesh and blood, while others would become hungry for power. But no matter their meal preference, one thing is certain. The Rakshasa will feed. Thanks so much to Skillshare for helping to support the creativity around our campfire. The legend of the Rakshasa has been with humanity for quite some time. Their earliest depictions describe them as furry behemoths, with red eyes and giant incisors. However, more recent interpretations show them resembling a humanoid cat person, or just a slightly hairy human, but with fearsome teeth. And though their truest forms may resemble animals or demons, many were also adept shapeshifters, who could fly and turn invisible if needed. And if they decided to make a meal of someone, it's said they would draw their victims in close by transforming into someone they knew the human would trust. Now, while some Rakshasa were content messing with people's minds and eating a human every once in a while, others had more grand ambitions to spawn children with both humans and gods and steal empires. In fact, one of them even managed to manipulate the gods themselves, Ravana. Many variations of Ravana's tale have been told throughout the ages. Born to a Rishasi mother and Vishrava, the grandson of the god Brahma, Ravana had many siblings. However, for years, only he and two of his brothers, Kumbhakarna and Vibhishana, committed sacrificial rituals involving fire and mantras so that they could receive blessings or boons from their great-grandfather Brahma. Not exactly what you'd be expecting from half-demon children, right? Well, this behavior was encouraged by their maternal Rakshasa grandfather, Sumali, whose agenda would prove to be less about his grandsons paying proper homage to the gods and more about something a little more sinister. Though it should be noted that asking for these boons was tricky business, and you had to be very specific in your requests. Something Kumbhakarna learned the hard way when the other gods tricked him into requesting the boon of interminable sleep, which resulted to him being fast asleep every day of the year but one. Meanwhile, Vibhishana asked that his boon be that he would never be allowed to stray from the path of righteousness. An interesting wish to say the least, but sure, boon granted. What could go wrong? After witnessing all of that, Ravana knew he had to choose his words and actions carefully. And wanting to set himself apart from his brothers, he performed the most extreme penance by chopping off his own head. But because he was a Rakshasa, that wouldn't kill him. Rather, with every head lost, another two grew in its place until he had ten heads. Also, at the end of all this exercise, he ended up with twenty arms as well. Very impressed, Brahma would grant Ravana invulnerability from most of his creations. However, there was one small caveat that should be noted that humans didn't make that list. Little something to think about for later. Next, Ravana approached Shiva, who was meditating on Mount Kailash. But Shiva did not like being interrupted, so he punished Ravana for disturbing him. Now, again, versions of said punishment differ based on which telling you hear, but one thing is known. Ravana's scream of pain was heard far and wide. In an act of fealty, Ravana presented one of his ten heads, because, hey, he had them to spare at this point, which in the end did earn him a boon. This time, it was an invincible sword. Throughout all of this, Granddaddy Sumali was watching with delight, because he was playing the long game. You see, it had been his idea for his daughter to transform herself into a beautiful woman to seduce Ravana's father and birth him a champion. Then he coached his grandson to win boons from the gods so that he'd become powerful enough to take over the kingdom of Lanka. However, as you'd imagine, Lanka already had a king, Ravana's own half-brother Kubera, who had taken control of it by defeating Sumali years ago. But now, with a newly raised Rakshasa army, his near invulnerability, and a sacred sword, Ravana avenged his grandfather by defeating Kubera in battle and claiming the throne of Lanka for himself. 
but no amount of power was enough for Ravana. And after many horrendous acts against the people of Lanka and the gods themselves, he finally committed the deed that would be his undoing. The power-mad Rakshasa decided to kidnap Sita, the wife of a chap named Rama, who was considered the seventh reincarnation of the god Vishnu. As detailed in the Ramayana, Sita had been under guard, but Ravana shapeshifted into the form of a street beggar, and when the sympathetic Sita tried to help the man and got too close, he snatched her up and flew her back to Lanka. When news of this crime reached Rama, he raised his own army. Comprised of humans and demons, along with Hanuman, the Monkey King, and his monkey soldiers, and went to retrieve his beloved. At which point, the righteous Vibhishana tried to talk Ravana into returning Sita. It was the right thing to do, after all. But Ravana didn't want to hear any of that noise, and he banished his younger brother from Lanka. But here's the rub. Remember when we told you that Baby Bro's boon was that he would never be allowed to stray from the path of righteousness? Well, that was still very much in effect. Which meant that since Ravana would not return Sita, Vibhishana would join Rama's camp. Divinely mandated family squabble achievement unlocked. And because Vibhishana had lived in Lanka since Kubera had been ousted, he knew the best ways to attack Lanka. And he also told Rama Ravana's weakness, that Brahma's boon had not given him protection from humans. With these sizable advantages in play, their armies clashed. And when the two leaders faced each other in battle, Rama shot Ravana in the heart with an arrow blessed by Brahma, and he finally met his end. Turns out, Rama was still human enough after all. Reunited with his wife, Rama left Vibhishana on the throne of Lanka, where it's said that he ruled peacefully for many, many years. And for this, he was also granted immortality and had some kids of his own. Heck, for all we know, he and his whole family could still be walking among us. Though who's to say if all of his descendants would follow in his righteous footsteps? Perhaps some instead mirrored Ravana's path, collecting power and puppeteering mortal fates, ruling civilizations through chaos with only the desire to control, disenfranchise, and subjugate. <laughs> nah, that could never happen. Uh, wait a minute, actually. But you know what can always help combat said chaos? The power of good people's creativity, which is why we're so happy to have Skillshare around. For the uninitiated, Skillshare is an online learning community featuring thousands of inspiring classes for creators, letting you explore new skills and deepen existing passions. Plus, since Skillshare is curated specifically for learning, that means there are no ads like this one, and they're constantly launching new premium courses so you can focus on wherever your creativity takes you. Lately, I've been trying to figure out exactly how really awesome logos tick, and found the class by Aaron Draplin, Logo Design, Secrets of Shape, Type, and Color. Not only was it useful as heck, but it helped me get some ideas out of my head and into production. Another great course I clicked with was Creative Writing for All, a 10-day journaling challenge by Emily Gould, which taught me to notice new details I could use in my writing, and really helped me get some ideas out of my head and into production. And since I'm always trying to utilize my time more efficiently, I turned to my old Nebula pal Thomas Frank and his Productivity Masterclass Create a Custom System That Works, which not only helped me get hours of my work week back, but also really helped me get some ideas out of my head and into production more efficiently. Are you sensing a theme here? <coughs> New show. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Uh, something in my throat. So whether you're a dabbler or a pro, a hobbyist or a master, you can discover what you can make with classes for every skill level, all for just $13.99 a month when you sign up for an annual plan. Though if you want to get really creative with a sweet deal, the first thousand of you good beans that click the link in the description below will receive one entire month of Skillshare absolutely free. So you can learn something today you didn't know yesterday, all while supporting us at EC at the same time. Creativity for the win. A huge thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Casey Muscha, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, Kyle Murgatroyd, and O'Reels One for being our legendary patrons.